You're rocking with the bigs. You already know. Chicago sports. Fires out of the deep left center. Man, ain't no talking about Chicago basketball history without mentioning this guy right here. And, you know, it's a lot of talk about, you know, giving people their flowers while they're still here. It's important. And, man, P-Mac, you there, brother? Man, you know I'm here, my dude. Man, I'm definitely you, my guy. For those that don't know, from South Shore High School to Kennedy King, DePaul Blue Demons, all the way to the NBA, Phoenix Suns, Golden State Warriors, and many stops in between, man. P Mac been all over the world. Yes, sir. But man, um, like I said, one of Chicago's legends. And man, personally one of my top five favorite guys in the history of Chicago basketball to watch, man. So we'll get down, we'll get into that further down the line. But that's strong, man. Hey, that's look strong. here, man. That's look strong, here, P bro. Mac. We we gonna get into that, brother. But first of all, man, how you doing, man? Man, I'm good, bro, man. Appreciate you, man, for letting me share your share your platform, man. And you know, I'm still maintaining, man. Trying to get back and do some lot of things with the kids now, but you know, definitely happy to be on the soil and you know, sharing the platform with you, my brother. No, we appreciate you, man. You like the true representation of what on the soil means and stands for, man. It's like, uh, you know, I think the, the the term the term originated from the crib. You know, we you know we we are sure. uh, producers of a lot of slang that people take and you know spin it into their own way. But on the soil is like some official Chicago slang and. Like I said, you one of the official uh, representations of On the Soil. So, man, I just want to kick it off from the beginning, man, um, and we can take it from there. So you grew, you grew up in Sircon, right? Yeah, I grew up on 75th and Dorchester, born and raised. Um, attended grammar school around the elementary school. I was in the 74th and Dorchester. Got kicked out in sixth grade and ended up going to a Catholic school on Stony Island, St. Alvey, for two years. But, you know, I always been from around there, man. That's, that's the hood that made me, uh, shaped me, molded me, turned me into the player I was and the person I was. So definitely, definitely never forget about Dorchester and Sircon and where I came from. Nah, you know, I didn't know you went to St. Alvey, man. I, I know that means I, I got family that's worked in that school, so I'm pretty sure you probably ran across them. But, man... Man, I definitely went there for two years, man. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. I didn't know that. But, man, you talk about, you know, growing up and, and, and your surroundings basically shaping you as a basketball player. I guess the first thing I would love to know is when did you know that you had something special? And, and, and from that point, how did that affect you moving forward? It was, I ain't going to lie, bro, to be honest, it was like different phases. Coming into high school, I wasn't really like, the hottest recruit, you know what I'm saying? And I was in the era of, at the time, coming into high school, some of the best players was Brian Notry from Simeon, Michael Herman. Um, Ronnie Fields was one of the top players, but he was an underclassman at the time. So, you know, when I first got in, I had to prove I belonged on the high school level. So at South Shore, I started on varsity as a sophomore because a lot of people didn't remember that Don Pittman left South Shore and went to Carver, Carver and he yeah. took like the whole team from South Shore and, and took them to Carver with him. So anybody left on the South Shore team was pretty much leftovers or guys that Pittman didn't want, you know what I'm saying? And so I went there as a sophomore, made varsity, and initially I had to prove to the seniors and older guys that I was good enough. And, and once I proved that I could show them and I saw that I had a skill and a talent that they couldn't stop, I wanted to see how far I could take my gift. So, you know, each step of the way, it was about proving that you belong. For me, the college, whether it was JUCO, whether it was the pro-am at IIT, whether it was the NBA, it was just about letting the people know that you on the court with that, you know, I'm somebody special, I deserve to be here, and, and I'm a problem too. So, PMAC, were you 95 or 96? I was 96. I came out in 96, me and Ronnie Fields. Right. 95 was KG and, and Michael Herman. And, you know, they was loaded too, man. And it was just, it was crazy in that time. If you was, if you was hooping in the, in the early nineties, man, it was crazy, man. It was crazy in Chicago. Now, A lot check, of talent. Every now check it out. I, 
Now, Mike Herman was my year. I was 94. I played at Mount Carmel with Twan. So, Mike was my year. Yeah. An another one of my top Twan, five Dominic, favorite guys to Marlo watch. Bounce. Marlo, Marlo, yeah. Marlo was my backup. Mar Marlo was a sophomore, and he used to, he he was my, he was my, when I went out, Marlo subbed in for me. And Marlo went yeah, on I to, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, man. So Marlo went to Tulane. Marlo ended up going to Tulane. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. So, yeah. so over there at South Shore, I know it was you and Joel Bullock. Jo was Joel ninety five or ninety six? Joel was ninety six as well. But Joel just uh, me and Joel only played one year together. I got him to transfer from Hills to come to South Shore to play with me. But I was always a fan of Joel game, man. I would watch Joel years before I played against him, um, before I played with him, playing against him. He went to Bryn Mawr Grimmer School, um, 73rd and Jeffrey, and I went to James Madison on 74. So I got to see Joel before a lot of people. I have been knew Joel had a game. So, man, when he was interested in thinking about leaving Hells, I was, man, I was recruiting and pitching and trying to get that man to come give me some help. But, man, he was one of the most underrated, slept-on point guards to walk through Chicago, in my opinion. I might be biased, but, man, he was tough to me, bro. He was so tough to me. Man, just listening to the history, you know, uh, behind the scenes, this is all before my time, you know what I mean? I'm looking back on it like, wow, the, the high school scene was operating more like a professional scene or a collegiate scene than, than what I know the high school scene to be in my time. You know what I mean? So what I basically would love to know is, what were some of your most, like, crucial battles outside of, you know, the high school court that made you, that got you into the conversation of these guys and that, like you said, that special time of Chicago basketball? Man, I had, I had a lot of battles. They started in the streets before I even got to get into high school or to IIT or to where most people took notice of me. Um, it was a rapper named Slap Polaroid. He was real All cool day. with Bump J. All day. His, his real name, Kenneth Vershaw, and and Ken had stupid game. He was from the east side too. So, you know, he had his guys and, and all my guys was GDs and Ken had his guys, they were stones. So he was one of the first people I ever like locked up with and played the game. I went to his hood, played against him uh, in front of all black stones and I'm the only GD there. So it was crazy, <laughs> crazy to even think that I got out of there with a win and made it. So mm -hmm. that was my first introduction to like Man, one on one, bully ball, mm -hmm. fight to survive, mm -hmm. sc scratching, clawing. You like, you worried about if you're going to get up out to the park and make it home and count your little money. You know what I'm saying? And, mm -hmm. and for me, that was how we made money. Like, I didn't come from a lot of money growing up. So, you know, people in the streets, everybody found their player that they liked and they backed them and they bet and they put you against somebody else. So, that was how I met Bobby Smith. That was how I met mm -hmm. Twan. That was how I met a lot of the people in the streets was from me playing other people in the streets. So by the time I got to the high school and caught them guys later at IIT, it wasn't really a problem. But some of my biggest, earliest, first battles was me and Sly used to go at it. I, I played Tony Allen early. He was young. I went in the Calumet buildings and, and mm. played Tony Allen. I beat a young Tony Allen before he got to be who he was. And, and I would just go everywhere and travel to, you know, try to play people, man. I ain't really care who or where you was, and, and I just chase people. I chase Ronnie Fields for probably a, a summer and a half trying to play him because he was so elite and everybody knew who he was. I was just trying to, you know, catch up to him and show him that, you know, Southside got some killers too, and we got somebody that's high-flying and somebody coming and somebody can do everything you can do. Man, I know all about that story with, about you on Sly, man. I'm uh. You know, I'm part of I'm part of the history too, man. So I I know about them battles firsthand. So if people don't real, people Sly don't know about too, hey people don't know Sly, Sly had game. game. People don't know Sly, Sly had game, Joe. Mm -hmm. And he was like six five way yep. back in the nineties. Like yep. man, that boy was so tall. <laughs> no, Sly was the truth, man. That's but crazy. Yeah, yeah. So it, you know, like he said, man, the the streets is where you get your stripes. Then that's why when you get to high school, college, and all the yeah. rest of that, it's like a breeze because you didn't been through it all. Once you, if you, if it's you like make stealing. it, through the, like all, stealing, bro. It's all blind. day, bro. So, so, so you you at at South Shore, and then I know you ended up. So you played with the Illinois Fire, right? Yeah, I played with the Illinois Fire. Yeah, definitely did. 
and that's that's now the Mac Irvin fire. So you played with um, was I know Jimmy. I played Sanders. under the daddy. The daddy coached me, Jimmy Sanders. Ronnie Fields, uh, what was our big man? Man, went to Fresno State, uh, lefty, looking dead at him. Randy Holcomb. Randy uh, Holcomb, yeah, yeah. Randy Holcomb played with me. Aaron McGee played with me. We had a nice team. Eli, Melvin Eli was on that team. Yeah. We was loaded. We lost to uh, an Arizona team in Vegas, Mike Bibby and some more players, but we was loaded, bro. That, that, that Illinois Fire 96 team was loaded. So so you get done 96, you get done at South Shore. How did you end up at Kennedy King? Because I'm going to tell you a story that you probably don't even remember. I first left South Shore and I went to a JUCO in Tallahassee, Florida. Right, uh, right. Called TC yeah. That was the number one junior college in the nation. We lost the championship that year to Indian Hills. Indian Hills was ranked number two. We finished like thirty-five and two. I'm the I'm the second leading scorer. We had a kid named Boosie Thornton, ended up going to St. John's and scored like forty on Duke. He was on that team with me too. But um, I got kicked out of there after my first year because I came back to Chicago when I wasn't supposed to. Right. Feeling myself, we had a weekend off. You know what I'm saying? And the coach was like, man, don't go back home. Nobody. We got practice Sunday. Now this like Thursday night. So I'm thinking, man, I can make it to Chicago and I'll be back for practice Sunday. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, I'm going to try and get the shot. I missed the crib. Came home, missed practice coming back. Didn't make it coming back in time, man. Me and my guy kicking it, BSing around in the streets, man, just being stupid. Missed the practice to get back Sunday. I called my coach on the way back from, like, we in, like, Alabama somewhere. I'm like, Coach, uh, I got a flat, man. I'm stuck on the other side of town. I'm trying to act like I'm in Tallahassee. All day. The man already knew I wasn't in Tallahassee because somebody on the team told him I went back to Chicago. So he said, man, I don't care where you at. I don't know where you at. But wherever you at, turn back around and go back home. I'm mm. through with you. Mm. Now, I'm coming off a of freshman year where I shot 72%. I averaged 16 points. We was 35 and two, and we lost the championship at Hutch. So I'm feeling myself. I'm just knowing he gonna let me slide. Man, that man cut me. Like, I will never forget that to this day. I felt so down and, and empty, man. I didn't know what to do. So I called back home, and um, the coach at Kennedy King was a guy named Willie Little, legendary coach, man, in Chicago, coach that yeah. manly, coached a lot, a lot of players, man. He reached out to me and, and, and just took me under his wing and guided me. I sat out that next year and just watched to get my grades right. And then the next year I went to Kennedy King and, and he kind of just helped me begin to blossom as a player. And like, he let me dribble the ball and like be a guard and shoot shots when other players, other coaches always use me close to the basket because of my strength and my mm -hmm. athleticism. Mm -hmm. Willie Little was the first one to let me just, man, bring the ball up. I could shoot threes if I wanted. He never really harped on me about, like, no, don't do this, no, don't do that, like most coaches did. So once I went there, like, I just got an extra confidence in my game flourish, and then from there, yeah, I went to DePaul. Did 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 uh, did Trip play with you in Florida, Tyron Triplett? Absolutely, Trip played with me. Me, Trip, Jimmy Sanders, Boosie, all of them, man. We was so loaded, man. Tyron Triplett, one of the best shooters I ever seen in ever. my life. Definitely, ever, definitely played with me. Definitely played with me. Big bucket getter, man. That's my guy too, man. Shout out the Trip. So check it out. So when you guys went, when you got to Kennedy King, so you remember Corey Brown? I definitely remember Corey Brown from Morgan Park. CB, yes, sir. Man. Yes, sir. Yeah. Murder, man. We so I got it in with y'all one day <laughs> before a game, and then y'all literally went out and destroyed some people by about fifty at Kennedy King. And I'll never <laughs> forget, bro. I'll never forget. Somebody shot a jumper. It came off long, and Corey will tell this story to this day. He says he went up, and I was in the stands. He went up for the rebound, and before he could jump, he said he felt a foot on his head. <laughs> <laughs> and it was you and you caught it classic p mac catching it over everybody putting it back in but i remember the play but i he says when he before he jumped he felt a foot on his head and Corey was six four <laughs> on his head on his head yeah Corey, so he was six four man i used to just i don't know i had a knack man i was always uber like super athletic i just had a a knack for 
like I was taught early, if somebody shoot, you got to come from the opposite side. Like I had a guy in my neighborhood named Wayne Irvin, legendary dude to us in our neighborhood. Played at Chicago State, mm -hmm. played at Wyoming, okay. played against Patrick Ewing. He passed away a couple years ago, but went to CVS. He was a he was a decorated player. A lot of people knew him, and he taught me early, like you attack offensive rebounds from the opposite side. So if somebody shoot from the left wing, you crash from the right. If somebody shoot from the top of the key, you can crash because it can go either way and you can get it. And I, and I was so big and athletic. I used to just, I used to get a lot, a lot of tip dunks. Like for some reason, people never boxed me out. And once I got a running start, if it I came off awesome. anywhere, if it came off anywhere over the rim and bounced up, you was, you was dead. Like wasn't no, <laughs> wasn't no chance to stop me. That's crazy to think. Gino, of course you would. I always play with Gino. He's always somewhere in the middle of Chicago <laughs> basketball history. I was there. Bro. Every nook and cranny <laughs> of it. But Paul, man, um, I'm, the story you told about where you got to Kennedy King, man, it, it, of course it resonates because I feel like with any Chicago Hooper overcoming uh, hurdles, it's part of the game. Yeah, you know I mean, I feel like it, it's one of the lessons that everybody learns on their path. But what were some of the voices, you know, that that were prevalent and, and you know in your in your circle around that time, people trying to keep you on the right path? I had a lot of guys around me, man. I had both my parents, first of all, so. You know, that's where my foundation came from. I, I, I came from a household with a mother and a father that I saw every day and I saw them work. My street ties and street affiliation came because I just jumped off the porch and wanted to get in the streets. I didn't really even have to do some of that stuff I did. I had two good parents with two good jobs. I even, them usually the kids that jump off the porch and be in the streets. So, you know, all my guys was single parent households. Man, wasn't going to school. Them was all my friends. So, you know, once I jumped out out there, like, man, it was crazy to me, man. It was just so crazy to me. And, and those experiences helped me. Like, it molded me, bro. Like, when I was young, I was high-headed. I used to gang bang. I was GD crazy. I got shot. Mm -hmm. I got stabbed. I, I could have easily not made it to be what I became. You know what I'm saying? By the grace of God, I'm made it, it lucked up but it's a lot of people that was just as talented or more talented than me that's the came to the streets or that didn't make it. you know you know for every paul mcpherson it's a brand leech or you know somebody Man. michael herman or somebody who should have made it that didn't you know what i'm saying so, so i carry their weight too like you know we was all underdogs so you know i just i just tried to Man, uphold the reputation of our city. I knew that Chicago was known for having killers. And so when people saw me and knew I was from Chicago, I, I never wanted anybody to be like, oh, how he how he ain't one of them dudes. Like, you know, I wanted to leave an impression wherever I went, whoever I played. So that all stemmed from where I grew up at and, and you know, how I was raised. Classic, man. Like you, the, names, the, the names, you know, like you said, Mike Herman, another one of my top five favorite guys to tap in with. He, he was my year. I went Kill to him. summer school with Mike, played against him a few times from Hales to Western House to King. Mike mm. is one of the illest of all. Like, you remember, yeah, and we're going to get into IIT down, later down the line, but Got when you. he gave Randy Brown that 50, that 60 piece. 60, boy, yeah, 50, 60. Some, some 57. We, we rounded it up. We say 60 because if you score 57, I'm rounding it up. That's six, right. Nobody else scored 57. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, man, Hearn was tough, man. Hearn yeah, was, that, he was ridiculous. Crazy. All right. So you leave Kennedy King, and we know what was bubbling. Are you any? I mean, I know why you chose DePaul, but. Who else? Who? What other? Uh, who else was recruiting you? And I mean, obviously, I know why you chose DePaul, but for the people who may not know, you know, uh, <laughs> talk about story. that recruiting Before process. I told, crazy story, man. This is this is a true true life story. Uh, Lance Williams from Julian was one of my best friends. Uh, I played against Quentin, Lance, Bobby, all of them, right? So, as I'm watching them, they first year there. They, they got the city buzzing. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, Q killing, Lance killing, Bobby killing. I'm like, ooh, I'm starting to get like an itch. Like, man, all they need is a couple more pieces. You know what I'm saying? Man, I definitely can help fooling them out. You know, like, let me get in. DePaul was not even recruiting me. Like, this is a true story, bro. Mm. From Chicago, they're killing, tearing the city up. 
they initially wanted Ronnie, right? Which I couldn't have been mad at because in high school, Ronnie was more polished than me. Right. Even though I thought I could do everything just as good as him. In high school, Ronnie was like Jordan through the city. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. I was like Dominique or somebody. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> DePaul wanted Ronnie. When Ronnie didn't, when Ronnie got in an accident and wasn't going to qualify, I'm knowing I'm the next one up. I'm like, oh, they got to get me. Then they wanted Jimmy Sanders after Ronnie ahead of me. So I was in my feelings now at this point. I'm actually finna go to Cincinnati. I was about to sign oh. and go to the University of Cincinnati because Bob Huggins loved Juco players. Yep. He had came down to the All-Star game, watched me win MVP. Man, that man took me out to eat. I was literally like two days from signing, going to Cincinnati. Tracy Dildy comes as I come back because the rumor starting to sound like that I might go to Cincinnati. Right. Tracy Dildy was the main reason why I went there along with Lance. I wanted to play with Quentin and Bobby and, and just like build something. But at the time, like people was pushing me and Quentin against each other, like rivals, you know what I'm saying? But Quentin was two years younger than me. I didn't really try to get into that, but you know how the city just make you become a rival with somebody, you know what I'm saying? You ain't necessarily got no beef with this dude or nothing. It's just somebody think he better than you. And before you know it, y'all standing face to face finna play each other in a one-on-one -on -one for a few thousand somewhere at some park. So I just wanted to go and play and see what all of us could do together on one team. We all was from Chicago. We had a seven-footer, Steve Hunter, coming to help us out. We had another kid from Michigan, Kerry Hartfield, who was a, Hartfield. Uh, wow. was a McDonald's All-American. He was coming. So, you know, I wanted to just stay home, man. I wanted to put on for my city. I wanted my guys and my family to be able to come see me play. And a lot of people thought I wouldn't, like, man, uh, you ain't going to make it. You, mm -hmm. you ain't going to start. You're going to come off the bench. That's Q team. That's this and that's that. And once I got there, they knew I was a killer. Bobby and them knew. Lance knew. Q knew. All of them knew. Like, man, dude, I ain't backing down from none of y'all. I'm here to help y'all, but I ain't, I ain't scared of none of y'all. And so that was the beginning of uh, probably the most, man, I would say, like, I went to the league for two years, which was really short, and I played overseas eight years. Those six, seven months at DePaul was probably the best time of my life playing with them dudes, man. Man, so so why was it just six, seven months? Because I, I know you, you know, I know you were deciding between the league and DePaul. What was it that, that ended up convincing you that it was time for the league? I kind of used Quentin as a measuring stick, to be honest with you, to tell you the truth, bro. As I'm coming in, Quentin already the man. And he was a projected lottery pick that year, even though he ended up dropping and going. I think he went 18 that year we went. But initially, he was a lottery top 10 pick, right? So I'm practicing against him every day. We never on the same team. I'm always going against him. I never wanted to, like, the first day there, they do, they do starters against the reserves. I tell Tracy Dildy, put me on the reserve team. I got Q. Like, this is the first day we get to practice. So initially, like, everybody like, oh, shit, here come, you know what I'm saying? Here, here they go with this. And I just used Q as a measuring stick. Like, Q was a, a, a tremendous rebounder. He could shoot. He started to develop his shot. Yeah. But I saw I saw things in this game that I could do that he couldn't do. Mm. And, and it was things that he could do that I couldn't do. So as we started to battle and, and eventually became teammates and helped one another, I felt like if it was some games where Q wasn't the leading scorer and I was the leading scorer at Duke, I was the leading scorer and, and he was, you know, had a tough night and it was some nights where I had tough nights and he went off. So I kind of used him for my barometer. You know what I'm saying? He ended up averaging 17 that year. I averaged 15.6, but the system was designed for Q. So if I would have stayed, I definitely felt like I could have averaged more than 16.6 that next year. But I was just thirsty, ready to leave, man. And I was so mad the way we lost in the tournament. Mm. I finished that last game against Kansas, a double overtime game with 26 points. I fouled out, and we lost. And it was like 10, 12 scouts that are CQ. Q had about 18, missed a lot of shots. I was like, shit, I'm leaving. I'm finna try it. Like, ain't nothing else to do. Yeah. Ain't nothing else yeah. to come back for. I feel like I can make it, and I'm going to bet on myself. And a lot of people, you know, people that was close to me thought I had a chance. But a lot of people said, you know, what are you doing? You stupid. Why are you leaving early? Q leaving, so stay next year, and it's going to be your team. Like, I heard it from so many different places on, like, not to leave. But I just had it in my heart that I felt like I was good enough, and I wanted to bet on myself.